Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second half of our Music Industry Occupations Roundtable today. This is the ninth annual Music Technology Advisory Board meeting. And uh, there's been so many interesting conversations over the years that we thought we'd open it up to the public so that you could gain from the valuable insights that our panelists have to share uh, with us. I'd like to start off with the panelists introducing themselves, please. My name is Cynthia Scott. I'm in education. I work as a bridge between industry and education. I'm with what's called the Multimedia and Entertainment Initiative, which is a project out of the State Chancellor's Office that manages the community college system that you are in right now. And we are looking at the big picture of workforce training needs for the state of California. And in one niche of that would be audio, the audio element. So I'm here to talk about those issues. I'm Jeff Monday uh, from Apple uh, Incorporated. I work with uh, community colleges all over Southern California, uh, and I am an account executive. I'm Joe Cusera. I work at UC San Diego. I'm the chief engineer for the music department and the recording studio there. Uh, my name is Rob Collier. I'm the assistant technical director at the California Center for the Arts Escondido and work um, with all aspects of technical theater, including audio. Hi, I'm Donna Florin, the Director of Theater Operations with the California Center for the Arts Escondido. I, we, uh, I supervise the backstage crews uh, who oversee all of the technical elements, including audio. Uh, my name is Wesley Switzer. I am a uh, Berkeley College of Music Boston uh, alumni and touring and session recording bass player. Uh, and also just moved out here and opened Milestone Recording Studios, which is a mixing and mastering primarily facility in Los Angeles area. Hello. Um, my name is Vikas, and uh, I'm a high school educator. Um, I uh, <coughs> wrote the curriculum for recording arts at the high school level for the state of California. And... Um, I just have a passion for uh, bringing music into youth's lives and helping them uh, forge their way into the industry. Um, that's it. Good afternoon. My name is Mario Gonzalez. <coughs> I'm a Miracosta faculty. Um, I'm the director of the Miracosta Latin Jazz Orchestra. <coughs> I'm also a producer, arranger, composer, um, a Los Angeles studio musician also, um, and uh, I play the trumpet. <laughs> Hello, my name is Doug Moody, and uh, I'm a record producer. I've been fortunate since being in America. Since 1953, I have 41 golden platinum records, <laughs> and uh, I'm a leftover. I'm a leftover started in the late 40s, mm -hmm. and I'm 80 odd years old, so uh, you're gonna, don't ask me too many modern questions. <laughs> 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 I'm Jeff Linsky, and I'm a lifelong touring musician, and uh, also a composer. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Johnny Vatos Hernandez. I played in a band called Oingo Boingo for years, and uh, I'm alive and working in LA and studios and all that kind of stuff. Hi, I'm Dave Morant. I'm the director of service groups for Sony Computer Entertainment America. Uh, I'm actually music and sound design groups for Sony PlayStation. My name is Craig Zarcos. I am a uh, session drummer. I mix records, do a little bit of this and that. I'm here with Procraft Media, new company uh, for me, and we do design and integration of facilities like this, broadcast, recording facilities, performance facilities. Hello, my name is Kevin Page. I've uh, I've been a touring musician, professional musician for the uh, last 10 years. I also am Craig's business partner. We have a design and installation company of any pro media, audio, video, control systems, design, and uh, implementation. Uh, my name's Anthony Catalano. I'm a Pro Tools engineer and musician, and I freelance for various producers and MTV, VH1. Hi, my name's uh, John Pegler. I'm a 
was a touring pro player most of my life and more recently have joined the ranks of the regular populace. Uh, sales and marketing company uh, working with some of the major manufacturers of music uh, gear produced today and we sell to uh, retailers. Oh. I'm Chilitos. Um, I am a, a mixing and recording engineer. I run uh, my own school, Pro Tools School Certified Certification School in Los Angeles in Santa Monica. And um, I write books. I do all kinds of good stuff. So any questions on anything, just give me a call. Or call me. No, this is a question. I mean, cool. ask me. <laughs> we have a new panelist up in the center of the table. Hi, my name's Laura Perlman, and I'm a freelance music editor for films, and also an educator, uh, composer, and musician. We'd like to welcome our panel. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful panel. <laughs> the object of this get-together today is to help shed light on employment in the music industry. And the first question I'm sure that everybody has is, what is the present music industry? How can we define it nowadays? Is it just <laughs> performers? <laughs> we want to know. Is it just people on stage with a microphone? <laughs> no, you know, I, th I think it's uh, when you get your first five dollars for doing anything in this industry, you're now in the industry. <laughs> you know, and everybody's, everybody's talking about it's funny when you know studio drummer slash producer. We're all we're all wearing many many hats. So there's a lot of ways to make that first five dollars. I I think to be in 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 any of the audio industries, you know, you you've got to be able to hot swap what you do. You've got to be able to have as cover as many different topics as you can and know as much about the industry. I think there's you're very fortunate if you just find that one niche that is going to carry you through your career in music. You've really got to be able to wear many different hats depending on the day. <coughs> Whether you're, you're a session player who also becomes a producer, who also becomes the engineer, who also then takes that to the record companies. It's all of these things are what will make you have a career and open doors and opportunities. I think the music industry has become much more democratic in that you don't have to know somebody to, to learn some of the skills. You can get a computer, you can get some microphones, you can get a speaker, speakers, and you can start learning in whatever your skill level is, whatever things you're interested in, whether it's performing, you have a way to practice in your own house. And uh, you can be from Minnesota or Podunk, wherever, and still get a pretty high level and a diverse set of skill sets so that when you get into the industry, you have a lot more experience that than you bring with you than it used to be available to people. Many people think that the industry is primarily entertainment. Is there another aspect to the industry that we don't know about? Thousands, thousands of aspects. I mean, it's a huge industry, number one. I don't know what the la latest stats are, but I, I know just in retail sales a couple of years ago, it was like $5 billion worth of sales in retail. So if you take the encompass everything with uh, the whole of the music world, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest organizations on the planet. And to make it work is everyone from every walk of life to make it happen. Uh, one of the earlier guys that was here uh, does a lot of, um, uh, organizes the tours for a lot of major rock bands. And we were talking earlier, 80 plus people on a tour for Fleetwood Mac, for instance. That's 80 people you got to house and, uh, you know, there's road managers and uh, techs and, and physical therapists. And so, I mean, every, every aspect of life is encompassed in the industry. So if you want to be in the industry, don't just think, oh, I've got to play the guitar or a keyboard or blow a sax or something. There's a thousand avenues to get into it, whatever your passion is. Doug. Thank you. Those of us who have grown in the industry over the past 50 years, like myself, wonder if there is an industry left, wonder where it's going, but about every 20 years, we're flattened. We're all broke. We're out of work. First of all, 78s went to 33 and a third, because I was around. <laughs> and now we're going to digital, 
which none of us understand, but it, you know, when I say when the computer can say I love you and lick me like my dog, then uh, mm -hmm. I might get close to it. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the, whole pr the whole problem is we don't know where it's going. We only know that if you have any talent, if you have any go inside you at all, let it out. That's it. <coughs> go for it. I'd like to add to that. Um, I think uh, one of the uh, most important aspects uh, to kind of realize right now where the music industry is at is that uh, you up and coming and, and aspiring, you know, producers, musicians, uh, engineers, pro tools operators is that we're in an era and a crossroads of, of our industry where it's kind of uh, undefined as to what the future looks like. And so that's a, a great place for you guys to be. I mean, we can, we can sit here and talk about <laughs> the dire situation of, of the industry and whatnot, but <clears throat> again, we're, I think we're at, at a moment in the industry where it's gonna rebuild itself, and the young generation that's learning all this technology, that's being, you know, uh, uh, push, pushing what they're doing, and developing new ideas, and being innovative with, with uh, uh, their, their concepts, are gonna be the ones gonna be emerging, you know, the next 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, as the innovators of this industry. So you guys, I'm excited for you guys because we all have stories here that we can tell how we got in the industry and <clears throat> how we developed our, our, our uh, concept and how we got in and, and, and whatnot. But um, it's exciting to know that you guys are, are a form out here and are the next generation that are going to be developing all these great new ideas and concepts and softwares and doing things on a digital level. It's, it's going to be phenomenal. So I'm excited to see what you guys are going to do. Um, but again, it's, I think it's going to be a, um, an absolute uh, uh, incredible amount of opportunity for the young aspiring producer, engineer, musician to, to make some really amazing innovations. It was stated that there's 80 people on tour with a band that normally has five people. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know who those 80 people are. <laughs> Merch. <coughs> Merchandising? Oh yeah, merchandising. We got merchandising. We have uh, uh, business uh, business people that uh, take care of uh, all the per diems for for the crew. Uh, make sure that there are people. There's people that are that drive drive to hotels and check people in early. There's uh, people that are just um, running up and down light poles, setting up lights. There's people knocking over and setting up sound equipment. There's, uh, <laughs> if, yeah, if, if the star is really big enough to have their own chef, they got all that. They got to have people to wash the dishes. They, there's all, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous and a lot of fun. The, the, uh, 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 just a true story, which is really cool. In, in Europe, um, we went on the, I was on the road with Joe Cocker. We were opening up for him. And I would come in every three, about three in the afternoon, and there'd be a guy sitting there smoking with ashes going into the Caesar salad going, you guys are going to love this. <laughs> you know, so anyway. Yeah, so there's, there's a big crew, and they got to do England. laundry and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I could also talk to, about that from the facility point of view, um, even though things are going digital and there's innovations that are happening that we may not even be aware of right now, there's still a, a very important people aspect to um, the music industry from our point of view. Um, for instance, I kind of boast that no matter what happens, my job cannot get outs outsourced. Um, because I have to be on site with that show that day. They can't have somebody phoning it in from India. So that's a good aspect. The other thing is that um, there are, are numerous people who have to come together to even get the act into the theater. So whereas I employ stagehands who are carpenters, lighting people, audio, wardrobe, uh, video, very big video aspect of course these days, there's also the people that my facility has to book the show. So they're out there reading Polestar or doing research on the internet to find out what kind of act is going to work well in a 1500 seat theater in Escondido, California. Um, so there's our booking people and then on the other end of it, the band has their management and their booking people. So those are careers that maybe you want to think about too if um, you know, if you find out you have a good, um, you know, skills in terms of paperwork and organization, there's that, as well as 
Um, even just people who read over contracts, believe me, there's an art to writing a contract and then negotiating that contract um, because even though a contract by name really, you know, people think, well, it's hard and fast and you've got to follow it, it's actually just a starting point. So there's people who do nothing but negotiate contracts. And that's even before the tour hits my facility. So yes, digital, yes, software, all those innovations is still going to come down sometimes to two people on the phone saying, okay, do you want the green M&Ms in there or not? That kind of thing. Craig. Well, along that, the lines of that question, I would just encourage you to maybe set up a, uh, a field trip and go to the sports arena, get there at 5 a.m. when the light crew gets there, and, and follow them through a day if you want to see w everything that goes into a show, especially on a big tour. And it, it's actually a pretty neat experience to see how hard everybody works and how hard the support team works to get that show on, you know, on at 7 o'clock at night. It, it's military precision. You know, when you start talking these 20 semi shows and you've got a, you know, light crew rolling in the rig, building it on one side of the arena, sound crew, you know, getting their stuff staged and that one in the afternoon things go whoosh, like this, literally with, you know, the brawn of the stage hands. And then at one o'clock the uh, backline techs, you know, every musician's got a backline tech on a, on a big tour. There's a lot of times there's the Pro Tools guy, the, the tracks guy, you know, and everything has to coalesce it. At five o'clock, you know, it's it's sound check, and then it's dinner. There's a catering company. It's it's pretty darn impressive, and it's it's uh it takes uh, all those people to make it make it happen, make it smooth. And don't underestimate the the value in knowing the other person's job. Yeah. If you can go out on a tour and tech guitars, or tech drums, mix front of house, tour manage anything to to make yourself more valuable to the band or the artist, you're going to get on that tour quicker, you're going to get on the tour with that band earlier in their career, and if they do blow up, they do make it, they're, you know, you're, you're their guy and, or, or girl, and, uh, you know, that is infinitely valuable. Learn how to make microphone cables. There's a lot of people that don't have a clue, so. Chris. Yeah, in, in addition to everything that we're all talking about as far as what's happening on site, there's, there's a, a pretty significant team of people in the back office that are doing the pre-production and the, the design and the organization is, you know, everything from booking flights, transportation, hotels, all the stuff just to get the people to the destination, booking the tour, getting the venues, promoting, working with radio stations. That's a whole nother aspect of, of a performance, just like, just like making a record. You make the record, then you have to have the people get it in the stores, get it on the radio, get it on the internet, all the promotional aspects of it. So there's a whole other aspect to the industry where there's a lot of great opportunities for people. You know, maybe you're more interested in being uh, you know, a tour, not necessarily a tour manager, you might be a promoter, for example, or get into promotion, which isn't the team that's with the band. You're maybe you know, working with several bands and working with several venues and kind of connecting all the pieces. So there's, there's that aspect of, of this as well. It's quite large. Laura. There's also a whole, sorry, there's also a whole world which hasn't been brought up yet of film, which has film music, film sound, and that's a whole avenue of jobs from the composer, the composer's assistants, the composer's cable person, you know, everything that happens in the studio for the composer, aside from the 120 musicians that play in the studio and all the people that record that, music editor, music editing assistants, there's a whole world in the film world that's just pertaining to music, which is a whole avenue of jobs which aren't often remembered or thought of, and it's, you know, really a good way to be around music, a part of music, and a big avenue where people can still get started and work their way up, and it's a great learning, I think, experience and a great opportunity for students to maybe get some apprentice or internships at places like that as well. This is very valuable information. Uh, however, it sounds so technical and so rigorous. Um, what would you offer to a, a creative type who wants to break into the music industry who doesn't necessarily have the aptitude uh, or ability to be on a stage? Because I'm going to answer your question and it relates to what's already been said. I don't know if this is on, but I think you can hear me. Um, 
I think nothing, nothing exists by itself. Even fruit doesn't grow on a tree by itself. You have to cultivate it and grow it. And if you take any single product and look at it and trace it back to where it started, then you become aware of all the jobs that were involved. So even if we talk about record producing, someone has to press that plastic, you need a plastic supplier. So if you trace any single product, you'll automatically begin to become aware of all the different occupations that could be involved in that process. In doing so, I think every industry has some things that stay the same, things that are added to that that now become the same, which, which now will be added to permanently to that industry, and things which change. If you're going to look at the industry and add yourself to what's already being done, you have to be able to do it either better than it's already being done, or there has to be not enough people to do the job, so then there's a need for you. But as, as the industry and the technology and all this stuff changes, keeping what stuff also stays the same, as it changes and new pieces come into play, and you look at your product or you look at a process, whether it's film, live concert, or how you purchase a CD online, you'll notice there's some things that are missing. So if you critically look at every process and ask yourself, not only what's being done, but what isn't being done, why am I not be a able to purchase this CD off this artist's website efficiently with this credit card right now? Then it becomes, as an entrepreneur, you find new and innovative ideas by looking at what's not being done in those gaps, by taking the product, tracing it back, and looking in the loopholes and saying, this is what stuff's being done, and this is what's not being done. And when you have an innovative idea, that's also another way to enter the market um, from an entrepreneurial perspective. Where do we gain these skills to be able to be an entrepreneur? Uh, maybe Please, not to Dave. answer that question directly, but <clears throat> pardon me. You know, my advice would be, as a student, as you're first hitting the world, follow your passion. You know, a lot of you will be really passionate about what you do. And at, I know as I was growing up as a musician, as a bass player, I followed what I wanted to do, and at, regardless of anything else. But what I did keep m my eyes open to was other opportunities as I went along. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was fortunate to play in bands and, and be small time successful in, in what I did. But what I did is I kept my eyes open and, and I looked at the computer <coughs> industry, the video game industry, and I was prepared to be able to swap and write music and create sound design for a different industry. I think that fundamentally, if you don't follow your passion, while you have that energy as, as you're young, then you'll lose something. Don't, don't, if it's, whether it's as Chris said, it's, it's managing bands or it's doing wherever it may be, just make sure you, you spend that time while you have it following it. And never keep your eyes closed to opportunities. I, I always had the, this dream of playing with Prince by the time I was like 26, and I'd be on the road, and I'd be having big fun. Well, guess what? Prince wasn't banging the door down to find me. So I changed what I did and f stayed within the industry and was still creative. And I think that's the thing you always have to bear in mind. What is this crossover of when you're doing your dream and you realize that you need to move over to something else? When, when did that happen? For me, it was when I was about 28, 29. I was starting a family, and it was so, you know, all the pressures apply. That's why I'm saying when you're young, you've got freedom, and, and it's unlimited. You can stay up till 4 in the morning in the studio and, and you know, do demos and do whatever it takes to cut those tracks. At, my, at that age, when I was 28, 29, I was like, I'm too freaking tired to be doing this. I need to get home and see the family. <laughs> So then it was just a case of balancing, and that's what really drove me to find something else, but I still wanted to be in this industry. Stephen. I just wanted to say, if you're a creative type, <clears throat> and <clears throat> oftentimes <clears throat> you're not going to be up front because you're going to be creating something for someone else to do. Maybe you're a composer or an arranger, or you're going to lay down music to be supported. A lot of times if you're creative, you're not very good at other aspects, especially the business aspects. I mean, you all know really creative people who sort of live on another planet. And if you're one of those kind of people, you want to partner with many of these jobs that everybody's talking about down here. There are probably 
The support people are probably more numerous than the creative people. And if you have real originality, you could be rare in the industry, but you're going to need somebody to help you uh, stay focused and, and represent you and do those kinds of things. In fact, I've read somewhere for every creative person that's in the industry there, and if they're making money, there's like nine or ten people around to support them because they need help. <laughs> Christine. Chilitos. Um, talking about the um, the entrepreneurial um, situation, you know, that people get, uh, talking to my own experience, when I was, I was working on, as an, as an audio, I mean, um, audio engineer, meaning like designing, I was working at that time on the ADAT, I was one of the designers of the ADAT for Alices. Um, I had my, I remember my boss asking me that day, one morning says, you know, I was, you know, I was at AM Records last last night. I was working with uh, Julio Iglesias because he saw I was Latin. So, you know, he said he must be interested. <laughs> of course, you know, <laughs> I love the Beatles, not you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and he told me, you know, Umberto Gatica was doing the session, and Umberto Gatica, maybe you just, you may know him, may know about him. He was in, uh, in the s late seventies, eighties, the engineer for David Foster. And he was every Latin guy's idol, you know, dream. So I asked him, hey man, can I, can I go tomorrow, you know, to the session? He said, I don't know, let me see, let me ask. Thing is, he said, what were you doing there anyway? As I asked him, we both worked at Overhead in those days. And he says, you know, I was programming synthesizer for those guys. Um, and I was making $75 an hour. I said, wow. I want to make them much more money, you know. Just and what do you do? Nothing really. They, they just didn't call me. I mean, we were sitting there like waiting until you know they didn't call us, so they still got paid. You know, two nights later, or two days later, I thought about it. I said, you know, God, here I am. I want to be in that studio. I want to be an A&R Records. I want to be the engineer because the musician dream wasn't that there anymore. Like that was the crossover for me. The thing is that I said, what can I do? And talking about creativity of trying to get in the business. Because at that time, I was no, nobody, you know? Not that I am right now, but <laughs> thing is that I said, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. But I said to me, to myself, how can I get their attention so they can pay attention to me? I mean, their attention so, so uh, hey, I'm an engineer too, I'm a musician, I can do the sessions and all for those guys. Well, I had a dream. I mean, really, literally, a dream at four o'clock in the morning, boom, a mini book, in Espanol, in Spanish. I did my research. See, I'm not a writer. I'm an engineer. How, how do you say it? I'm not a writer. I'm a lover, not a writer, you know? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, that's, that's how I broke in. And, and, and I started writing. I got my Macintosh, you know, I was writing and writing after work and all these things. I was, at that time, I was designing MIDI, the circuitry on MIDI, and, and I was using MIDI as well. The thing is that I wasn't a writer. And, and, uh, and I said, I just wanted these guys to show a book to the world that this is Chilitos, man. I, I can do the job, too, and I, I want to work with you. That was my dream. Of course, when I finished the book, because nobody paid me for that, I did it after work, many, many hours. No, no publishers wanted to publish my books, any of them. I was so down until one day, and this is the funniest thing. When people earlier we were talking about how do you knock the doors, how do, how do you get your product out? Well, for me, it was a 4th of July party on a swimming pool where we were hanging out. We were working for Alices. The president of Alices said, hey, Julius, you know, I, I heard that you're doing a, a MIDI book in Spanish. That's great. He said, well, yeah, but nobody wants it. Why don't we do it? I said, what do you mean? Alices is a publishing company, but we can start with you. That was my break to get into the industry. Now, being a designer, working for Oberheim, all those things got me into, the, you know, the, uh, how do you say it, um, the major leagues. People hire me now for sessions, for whatever. And that's how you get in. When you have your dream, you have to be um, creative in sense of try to find what people have not done, so somebody said over there. And I, nobody had me in Spanish. So that's how my way to get in. So you always have to find somehow to get in. Chrissy Meyer? Please, John. Uh, 
I was talking about a year ago to a guy called Bob Clearmountain. Bob's <coughs> one of the biggest guys in the industry for the mixing stage of music. Um, I don't know if there's anyone better than him. It's subjective, but great guy. He got his start literally, you know, run, doing coffee runs. He just stuck to his guns. He believed in it, had a, like an intrinsic talent. I mean, he is now like one of the go-to guys, like the Stones, Springsteen. I was there and James Taylor was in there doing the final mix. It's it's just it's just off the charts, and I think if he was here today, he'd tell you what I would agree with him. It's like persistence. If you believe in it, if you got your heart into something, just stick with it. You know, you're going to get doors slammed in your face, no matter where you go in life, in any aspect of life, but in the music industry more so, because there's, it's a pretty cool gig. If you if you can land the, the the right job in the music industry, it's better than working for a living. Believe me, <laughs> um, it's hard, but you know it's it's worth sticking with. If you believe in it, I, I honestly believe you're you're. You may not, you know, like reach, reach for the stars and uh, reach for the moon and maybe grab a star on the way down. Um, but just go for it. Just absolutely apply yourself. Give yourself 101% constantly and uh, don't take no for an answer. Can, um, I, can I add? And sometimes I think when you do something well, such as, you know, everyone at the panel, um, minus myself, uh, that may, we, we perhaps take for granted that we do it well. And so I just want to add um, that when, when I think of people wanting to do something, especially on the entrepreneurship level, it's you must have a passion for it as we keep reiterating, but you should also be good at it. And so being good at it sometimes requires feedback. And not that you should rely you know, on everyone's feedback, but if you do something and people constantly don't like it, then I don't know if you'll be successful at that. So that is one thing that's important. Um, and the other thing I would emphasize is, in addition to passion and skill, which you can develop, you should have a mentor. And I, I, I think that's key um, in any sense, is, is to have that mentor to guide you along the way. Um, yeah, that's it. Cynthia. I'd like, to know, I'd like to know from the audience, from a show of hands, how many people are here are looking for a job now? Are you ready pe to be out in the workforce? And how many people are interested in starting some kind of small business, selling some of your creative work, doing something like that? You're entrepreneurial in some sense? Excellent. Uh, I wanted to follow up on what Stephen said about partnering and what resources are available for you to help you move forward in those kinds of dreams. One of the things you might know already know about is that there's a system in California called the Small Business Development Centers. And you've got one connected with Miracosta College. They're, they're scattered throughout the state. And there are places you can go with your creative ideas and your product and your service and get help in figuring out how to get that product to market. So you might want to take advantage of that. There are SBDC's Small Business Development Centers, and there's one with this college. And I'd like to um, broaden the discussion a little bit about what kinds of jobs are available now, what kinds of things you can get into. If you've got uh, a dream that you're going to be following and a passion and something that you do very well, but you might also want to get your foot in the door in some way to get into the industry. And some of the things that are opening up right now that you might not have thought about. Audio production is usually the piece that's missing in another production. It's the sweet spot that people need somebody really professional. You can get away with not great audio, I mean not great video, but you've got to have great audio to get something wonderful, to get something emotional. In the film industry right now, there's a huge shift towards small scale production, less expensive. The tools have shifted completely. You no longer need the huge uh, studios. It, everything is a garage quality now. I mean, garage environment. You can buy on yourself. <laughs> your car is never in your garage anymore. Yeah. You can easily affordable your own production level equipment. That's never been true in the history of music and the history of film. It's a huge shift, and that makes great opportunity for you. In video production, the audio element, the audio component, sound and music for video for the web. There is a huge market for that. Everybody needs some video on their website now. And the, the audio partner with that team is a critical player in that group. Um, the game industry, this is an enormous uh, shift that's happening. There are innovations, technological innovations that are bringing surround sound into three-dimensional environments. 
That's an incredible transition, an incredible change, and there's huge opportunity there. For the sound designers, the, the storyboarding of the sound elements, the production, the composing, as well as the technical aspect. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities to be thinking about in addition to um, theater and performance. Can I just uh, say with my company, I have more apprenticeships available for audio for video, especially sound design. Uh, we have computers with our 14,000 sound effects on them that I give to people to use, and you take the sound effects. I mean, I don't give them to you, but you get to, and you have to lay out <coughs> audio tracks to video or to uh, underneath books that we read. So apprenticeships and uh, our or my work, I really need those kind of people. And the audio for business, you know, I just want to back that up. There's a lot of work in that area. Wes. Um, I was just going to add, too, you know, a lot of people are talking about apprenticeships and internships and all of those kinds of things. And for a lot of you, if you can, while you're, um, you know, your expenses are low, maybe you're living at home or you're, you know, able to be a student, it's only going to get more and more difficult as you get out into the world and then you're working and then you're, struggling working at Starbucks to be able to be a musician or um, trying to be a coffee runner, coffee runner at a studio or whatever. If you can afford to be at home and save money, do those internships now. Do the, do the, the part that you can get away with not having to pay for rent and pay for all of those things now while you're at home because it's only going to get more and more difficult. So if you can, you know, make the time to do that now as busy as you think you are. I can pretty much guarantee you're going to get more busy and it's going to become more and more difficult. So do it as soon as you can. It's obvious that the music industry is not a normal business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have, yeah, it's <laughs> definitely an abnormal uh, existence in a lot of respects. But there are some normal aspects to this. When I say normal, I'm talking about what's <coughs> typical for industry. And the music products industry represents a kind of a normal part of the industry. It's a um, kind of a seamless way to meld together sales, marketing, and a love for music. Do any of you have any experiences in the music products industry that you'd like to share about how you've taken your glamorized lifestyle and all of a sudden become a normal person? <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of my life really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, mild rock and roll star some years ago and uh, now I've schlepped around uh, products to retailers. Uh, I, I work with a lot of major manufacturers like Moog Electronics, EMG Pickups, um, uh, Hofner Guitars and a host, host of others. Uh, at one point we, when we had the earlier talk was uh, I, I brought up um, if you want to be in the industry be in the industry if you can't automatically arrive at your goal of being a rock star maybe go work as a sales guy in a retail environment or do something to stay in the industry keep your mind set on music but it's 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 all good you know I mean it, it just just being around music is a beautiful thing and uh, I've had, I had a great career and I, I still play I'm still active and uh, you know, I just stopped the touring aspect, and uh, <coughs> when I decided I wanted to get back into it, people were going, "Who are you? We don't know you anymore." <coughs> um, but it, that, that would be, you know, one of my pieces of advice, for what it's worth, is that just be in the industry, get in in any capacity you possibly can, and just then filter your way through to where you want to be. But don't do something else. I mean, do, you got to live, you got to pay the bills, but do do something if you possibly can in the industry, and then then really concentrate on getting to where you want to be. But uh, don't do it the other way around like me. <laughs> be a musician and kind of slide off the, off the face of the earth. <laughs> Jeff. Well, I, I have been a lifelong musician and, the, and, and it's all I've ever done for a living, but I've had to rely or, or got to rely on the help of my sponsors because I endorse products. Yamaha just came out with a new guitar and, and I, they brought in a f just a handful of guys to help them to, to, to evaluate the instruments and decide what, what, uh, you know, what they needed to change. And they just came out with the prototypes last week. And, and I have one of these prototypes now. And, and there's people, Yamaha is the largest instrument manufacturer in the world. 
and they're the largest music company. And as a musician who, I mean, it's all I've done for a living. I've played gigantic concerts for 20,000 people, and I've played little things for handfuls of people. And it's been like that my whole life. But to me, it's like incredibly attractive if Yamaha said to me, and there are people working for Yamaha who do this, said, well, how would you like to just go out and demo these instruments? They've actually asked me to do that, and just go around and demo these instruments, and all of a sudden, you're going to have a guaranteed income. Reliable paycheck, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. a guaranteed <laughs> income demonstrating these instruments around the world, and you can still do your concerts and make records, but you got a guaranteed income. And I, I met a guy at the last NAMM show who's a piano player. He's incredible. He's really great. And I thought, wow, what a talented artist. I wonder what kind of a career he has. <coughs> he says, I don't have time for a career. I just demo for Yamaha. Yeah. And, it's, and he makes a fortune, and he has a great, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, it's a, a toss-up. You know, I don't think I'd, I wouldn't want to sacrifice my career to just do that. But boy, that, that certainly is nice to have that kind of uh, income. Talking about a predictable income? Yeah. You mean to tell me that the music industry is not predictable? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can imagine, I've never, in my life, I've never had an employer. I've never had health insurance that I didn't pay for. Mm -hmm. I've never had a retirement that I didn't put money into. I've never had, you know, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're self-employed. I've had, I've had record deals, I have managers and agents and publicists and all this stuff, but nobody gives me anything, you know. <laughs> You know, I'm still, I'm still an independent contractor, and generally, I mean, the musicians' union, name another musician, name another union where like 90% of their members are unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> we have a theater next door. <laughs> I'll speak with you about. <laughs> How, what do you, what do you advise to people who can't take rejection? Insecurity, oh, wow. <laughs> unpredictability. Get a different profession. <laughs> Get a dog, but business. yet they want to be on stage and be a star. Forget it. <laughs> Delusional. Oh. Karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> karaoke. There's a lot of a lot of rejection in karaoke. Rock band. Ben, be a rough room Rock out band. there. Yeah. <laughs> Therapy. <laughs> now this is a, a an erratic lifestyle that that we all lead here. Um, how does anybody I'd like stay to pitch in and, uh, and try and answer that for you a little bit, if I may. How do we stay stable? Well, the first thing is if you want to be in the entertainment industry, hang out, live with people, go meet people who are in the entertainment industry. Even if they're playing in a club or playing in a restaurant and have got a day job, they lead you to where they're going and where these people who have the same desire inside themselves. You may be watching a classical concert player, and yet you may inwardly only be interested in playing the blues. But the common bond of music, the common bond of being able to express yourself, will lead you if you have the courage to follow it. So you hang out with people who are in the entertainment industry and you widen your circle. You keep widening. Eventually you get there. Because. Um, education isn't the most glamorous job, but it's extremely stable and satisfying and peaceful and you can tour in the summers and your family gets a paycheck while you're away. <laughs> um, so it's not what all people think, but um, Definitely, you know, you're around students who are the most cutting-edge thinkers. Um, they're light years ahead. Uh, when I think of publications, people ask, well, how do you keep up to date? I say, my students give me news on the hour of what's going on and where it's going on. Um, so I feel extremely fortunate. Um, I've never been more surrounded by diverse musical knowledge in my life. And um, I get free products, free books. I get to meet incredible people, and like I said, I have weekends, evenings, and summers to tour. It's not totally glamorous, and you may not be able to reach uh, you know, rock star lifestyle, but if you love music and you want stability, it is an option. Laura, then Donna, please. Well, two, th two things, oops, sorry, two things. One is in talking education. The educational system for music now is amazing. I mean, it used to be you'd go to conservatory or maybe Berkeley, or that was kind of it. So just the fact that you could be here at Miracosta, and I know the 
you guys have, you know, amazing pro amazing things and amazing studio. Jenny's told me a lot. So at that, and, and it's in and of itself is amazing, which puts you way ahead of where at least I could certainly say I was, you know. It's just I didn't have access to anything like that when I was young. So you have that, and in adding to what he said, you know, there are apprenticeships and internships, but you can also, you should create your own internships. I mean, if you find someone, you love what they do, in a nice way, be persistent, hound them, and follow them around if they'll let you. I mean, you can make your own situations, and in, in if you've got the skills behind you, they'll be happy to have you around. Then you can maybe, when they're overloaded, say, hey, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? I mean, there, what's wonderful and terrible about music is there is no straight path, so you can make your own. And if you're creative in just how you go about getting work, there's just work everywhere, and you can network, meet more and more people, and it's just, you really, Computers, in a way, have nothing to do with it. It's still all about people and who you know, but you can make those connections. You don't have to be born with them or be related to them, or you can make things happen. Donna. Yeah, I wanted to touch on a couple of different things. And going back to what Vika said, I think it was Vika who said something about, um, you know, if, if you're not good, at some point you're going to have to just be honest with yourself and, and maybe realize that you're not going to be the one person on stage reaching superstar status. I think it also comes back to you got to be honest with yourself about what you can handle in your life. Uh, I know you can, you can get any number of touring stories about that's a very, very difficult life. I had to be honest with myself. I love variety in my life, um, but it made more sense for me to be in a facility and have all the wonderful shows come to me than to try to go out on the road. I did a couple of small tours and I, I'm not cut out for that kind of life, so I was honest with myself. Um, the other thing is um, getting back to, you know, maybe you've decided you're not going to be a, a musician for a living or you need to supplement it. Some of the best um, lighting people I've ever had are musicians. And that goes a little bit against the grain. You would think audio, but I've had some wonderful lighting people, and I think it comes back to the fact that they have a sense of, of beat and rhythm. Uh, when we're doing concerts, for instance, they also understand what the musicians are trying to create on stage, and they're able to support that with the lighting. So I've always found it very interesting um, that the musicians seem to come in and, and deal with lights very well. I also do want to put in a plug for our, the internship program at the California Center for the Arts. I don't know how much time we have today, so I'm not sure if we're going to be able to talk about it, but I do have information about it out at the table, and we're happy to talk to you about it afterward. Also, you know, we've, we've seen a, a big shift in the, uh, the business industry with, you know, the world becoming increasingly flat. Uh, in the last, or in the next five years, we're going to have more MBA graduates out of India than we will have college graduates in the U.S. Uh, and so there's, there's no shortage of MBAs, but what we're seeing is that a lot of people are starting to look for people with MFAs, Masters of Fine Arts degrees, uh, to come in and work with business because of their, their skills with synthesis, um, being able to take a bunch of different elements and bring them together in new and exciting ways. So, you know, there's, there's always the, uh, the business side of um, the house that, that is actually really looking at artists and creative types to bring into the fold um, to make their businesses creative and different and exciting. Very refreshing. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, just to uh, back up a little bit about products and making money with products and things. There, there's a whole aspect of, of music and sound that, that really gets overlooked a lot, and that's the acoustical aspect. I came in late, sorry. I, I'm, I have Polona Sound and Acoustics. We do acoustical architecture and design production facilities, et cetera. And, for example, you look around here, these, these devices that are holding the lights, that has a, an acoustical purpose. Somebody designed that and is marketing and manufacturing that. I started my company by building acoustical devices for my own studio as a producer engineer that happened to work really well. I needed something that would really clean up the low frequency, so for three years I built these prototypes, got something that really worked, everybody wanted it. I ended up patenting it and marketing it, and it was just basically built with a bunch of stuff from Home Depot the first the first time around. What that does as far as a career opportunity for you when you start looking at acoustical architectural products and design is that it takes you not only within the, the music community and keeps you working around studios and concerts and things like that, but if you get involved 
designing or developing or repping acoustical devices or products, things like that. It also takes you out into the entire world of acoustical architecture, which gets into conference rooms. And, <laughs> and it's, a, it's a large, it's a multi-million dollar industry. And it's still related to sound. It's still related to music. You end up, you know, working with artists that maybe you never would have gotten to work with as a consultant or a designer. That's how I've gotten to work on a lot of records I've worked on is because I designed a recording studio for somebody and they realized that I write and play and can engineer. So staying inside the industry, making money, keeping your passion as a musician or an artist or whatever alive, um, it's one of those things. Uh, how many people in here actually looked around and realized that that's an audio product up there? Show of hands. Not too many, you know. Just looks like something holding the light, but it's actually, I know the people who make that. They're, they're colleagues of mine, and it's shaped and, and curved in a way that it'll diffuse sound uh, in a distributed way so that there's a, a more, uh, ex a better experience in here acoustically. So that whole world of acoustics is as much a part of the uh, industry as <coughs> microphones and things like that. That's a wonderful other area for. Uh, people to focus in on besides music production. Yes, Wes. Um, I was just going to touch a little bit on uh, how invaluable I think it is to, to work backwards on your goals. And if you, if you set a goal, you know, for example, there's a lot of artists I think that I've worked with as a producer and bass player that, and I'll say, okay, well, what is your ultimate goal? And then they'll say, maybe I want to be like Britney Spears or I want to be a pop star. And then they'll give me their first song and it's a nine minute ballad and the you know first chorus comes at three minutes in i'll say okay well you're you know you really need to reanalyze what your final goal is and then make sure the things that you're doing there are kind of stepping towards that goal and don't be afraid to reanalyze and take an honest look at that to make sure that everything that you're you're doing is actually going to lead you down that path somehow um and at the same time th the networking thing is i think what everybody's saying is the most valuable thing that you can do because your skills are only as valuable as the people that you can share those skills with. Um, like at Berkeley, I knew a huge number of really, really talented people, both uh, singer-songwriters, performers, um, audio engineers, different things like that. And there they actually give you a rank um, where you're tested and then you get a number. For example, a friend of mine is now the, one of the lead um, audio engineers at Hanson Studios in LA. Last week, he did a session with Mick Jagger and Joss Stone. He was number 170 at Berkeley. So that, there's only 190. So mm -hmm. he was way down in that list. But he had really good networking skills. And he beat out everybody else in his class and was able to get that job just because he was out there. He was at coffee shops. He was volunteering his time at open mics, doing sound for them. And he just knew people. And that, you know doesn't necessarily matter how good you are. Yes, you have to have the skills and you have to do all of those kinds of things, but more importantly, are you out there sharing those skills with people? And I think that goes for performers or audio engineers or all of those things. The more people you can share your talent with, then the more you'll know and then the more times, you know, musicians, people, they like calling people that they know instead of just looking up bass player in a phone book. <laughs> so. Very valuable information, thank you. Uh, it seems like there's a Mick everything, Mick Jagger, McDonald's. Thank you. Dave. So I just want to add to that. I, I think that's critically important. I think you should say yes to everything. I think, you know, put yourself in every opportunity. You know, as a bass player, I, I was playing mostly pop bands, but I'd get sessions to do country, and I'd just say, whatever. Just say yes to everything. Obviously, make sure you back up. Don't just put yourself in situations where you're going to fail. But be sure you can back it up. But say yes to everything. Get yourself out there. Get known. And just and just be ready to take whatever life throws at you. But I wanted to the other question was other industries where you can make a living and, and not be killed by it is the video games industry, while it's still relatively new, um, I'm fortunate at Sony we have a team of about 50 um, either musicians or sound designers. We have a large team between here, Santa Monica, and San Francisco. We're working on maybe 15 to 20 games at any one time. We're working with some of the best writers in the, in the film industry, never mind anything else. Uh, and, and we look for variety and creativity. We have a, an unbelievable amount of creative latitude in what we do. 
typically producers will say, yeah, here's the game, you do all the audio. And it's like, okay, and what's the budget like? Well, it's comparable to film industry now. Uh, you know, we're getting half a million to million dollar budgets for doing sound for video games. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity. It's, it's, a, it's really, it's tough to get into, but it's the same thing. You can be in there, have, um, and work on a high profile game with incredible amount of creative latitude, much more so, I think, than some other industries now. So don't dismiss that as a, as a way to get in, because even as a musician, you could still be, end up playing on records and doing things beyond what you're, you may think is uh, the traditional path. Thank you, Dave. Donna. This might be an appropriate time to bring up work ethic, um, because we've talked about passion, we've talked about education to some extent, but um, in networking, I agree, is extremely important. Um, we, we talk. So if you come and work for me and then Wesley asks me about you later, I'm going to give him an honest assessment of, uh, yes, did the person show up on time? Did he or she work well um, and hard? Um, I think probably also you would hear from all of us up here that this is not an industry for clock watchers. So if you, you know, show up at, you've been told to show up at 8 o'clock and you walk in at 7.59, um, in, unless you're Mick Jagger, I think Mick Jagger could get away with that, but, um, you know, and then you're looking at the clock and expecting to walk out at 5 p.m., you're probably in the wrong industry. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's an industry where you almost can say the sky's the limit. You can go as far as you can take yourself. However, that does mean that you're going to need to work hard, keep learning, don't ever think you've, you know everything, um, and don't expect to start at the top. Because if you come to my facility, you're going to start as an intern and you're going to work your way up. Um, also, don't expect to use the latest equipment, depending upon where you go. Like um, Wesley was saying about his friend who was volunteering at open mic nights and coffee shops, you're not always going to get to work with the latest digital Pro Tools or whatever, or digital sound console. So it is good to know as much about analog equipment as possible um, and, and be willing to pitch in. Rob. Um, one of the things that um, I've run into in the business is people who pigeonhole themselves a lot, um, at least in the technical side of theater, by saying that, oh, I'm the sound guy, or I'm only, I'm only, I only mix bands, or, you know, I'm the lighting guy. Um, as far as our side of the industry goes, the people who work are the people who know the most. Um, you know, because one day you're a lighting person, the next day you're running mic cables for a band, the next day you're a monitor engineer. Um, so if you pigeonhole yourself and just focus on one thing, you may, be in, may become incredible at that one thing, but there are very few people who get to do that one thing all the time. So if you're looking for more maybe stability in the industry, I'd say learn as much as you can about every aspect of, that, um, of the um, business that you can. Mario. Thank you. <coughs> kind of, uh, one of the things I want to share with you guys, too, is that for me, um, the possibilities are really endless. Um, opportunity is out there. <clears throat> One of my personal experiences that I can share with you guys that I think has made my career like really exciting is that um, in a very short span, I went from playing, being a, the term player with Ricky Martin, um, coming home, doing a TV show, performing with Barry Manilow, uh, going back out with Christina Aguilera. So it, I've had this really interesting array of different types of artists that I've worked with. Um, and again, keeping an open mind is what's going to open those doors also. Uh, being, um, you know, approaching things with that sense of, of, of having those senses on that, that you're able to do and diversify your, your styles and in, in what you play in. And, and that to me is, has again led to, a, to some really exciting moments in my career. Um, and, you know, even to today where I can come here and share my experience and direct an orchestra here at the college. Um, and as of yesterday, I got called to contract uh, musicians for the Playboy Jazz Festival in June at the Hollywood Bowl, and I'll be performing there too. So again, it's a really, uh, if you, there's no real, uh, like you were saying, not pigeonholing yourself into being one type of musician or just being into one aspect of the, uh, of the industry. Um, and also being able to turn around and mix uh, and produce and, and, and be, uh, you know, an asset on the technical side too. 
um, it's very exciting. It's very exciting, and and uh, that's one of the beauties about this about being in our industry is that I think all these panelists can 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 attest to that. That's what makes our industry exciting is that that it's never the same. You know, is there's no redundancy in our in our uh, in our career. So it's uh, it's very dynamic. Um, but again, the way those, those you're going to make a career in, in, to be one of those types of careers that you got to be open-minded, be diverse, and and just have those sensors always on. I have to ask a question right here um, that I think is kind of looming around many of these comments, and it had to do with stability. You're talking about being flexible, being able to do all these other jobs. What do you say to somebody who is a nine to five person? that needs regularity in their life, their socks are organized in their drawer, their t-shirts are hung up on hangers, <laughs> <laughs> they expect something to happen because they have a preconception about things. <coughs> How are they going to survive in this industry? They won't. It sounds uh, <laughs> like it's unpredictable. How are they going to make Become it? Become an accountant, I would suggest. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I you you can you can do tech work you can be you know wiring wiring up racks for permanent installations is very uniform it's very methodical if you're wiring up patch bays that are you know 100 lines 152 lines it's a glorified electrician though really isn't it? well <laughs> it's the music business and and you can transpose that over to doing live gigs and doing mobile recording or you know or whatever so i i think that and that is a nine to five business in in a, a lot of sense of of what it is so if that interests you, that interests you, and, and if that's who you are, that I think, in my my personal opinion, I think that if you're going to be a producer, engineer, musician, those are the basics of what we do anyway. So you should be learning that skill regardless. If you are an engineer and you walk into some studio and there's a piece of gear that goes out, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to pull that piece of gear out and replace it. Or you know you you know you got a band in there and an artist in there looking for you to run the session and, and you can't because it's not patched right. That doesn't fly. So there is room for the uh, the predictability of yeah a lifestyle here. Uh, Doug like and then Donna, please. Okay. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you. I'd like to offer you an answer. There's a young lady. We're both young sitting over there and her name is Mary Ann now she's like 7 to 11 o'clock worker non-stop I'm the kind of guy that goes out and I fly by what an instinct I have I record whatever I feel like I should record he'll tell you I was the first one to pick them up off the streets and record them <laughs> <laughs> the Mystic Knights of the Oing <laughs> Go Boy. Exactly. Uh, so I always need a constant supply of money because I can't be bothered where it comes from. If you're going to be artistic and producing is a form of artistry. I mean, I spent 12 years of classic piano in order to join a rock and roll band. So, that, you know, that tells you it doesn't matter what you start out. It's where you're feeling, where you end up. She's a whiz at getting money from distributors, record stores, and people who owe me money all over the world in royalties, and that is a nine-to-five person. You cannot do it alone if you're going to be a success. You've got to have a retinue behind you. If you're going on stage, okay, you have 80 people. I only need two, one for the money and one to keep track of where I am. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> and wonderful, wonderful advice, Donna. Please, I think it's already, it's been stated, but just to uh, to go back to the regular time, um, you know, hours and such. And actually, I'm married to somebody who used to be a professional uh, union stagehand, and he couldn't handle the hours, and so he's now an ex professional stagehand because um, he wanted an, uh, the same office to go to. He wanted to have regular hours, and you just don't get that in the tech world. I just wanted to also make a point that. Um, like our hours are wacky uh, where we work. Um, we can work any day of the week, holidays, New Year's, Fourth of July, um, any time of the week. Uh, Sixteen-hour days are not unusual, um, and and we even go up to eighteen, twenty, twenty-one hour days sometimes. But it can get even wackier. So if you look at my hours and decide that's too normal for you, there's the other extreme too. So again, the music industry can encompass and can you can make it 
you could almost write your own job description at times. So if you want something even wackier, believe me, there are more extreme jobs out there. This seems like an elusive, exclusive lifestyle. People have to earn a living. How are they going to break into this lifestyle if they have to earn a living in the meanwhile, but yet they want to get their foot in the door? What is available to them? I mean, they need to keep a roof over their heads. They need to keep their payments done. Jeff, Jenny. Hi, I'm Jennifer Amaya. I stepped up here a little bit late. I'm an associate faculty member here at Miracosta. Um, my, my upbringing, I would say, in the industry, um, I actually started as a product rep. Um, in a weird sort of way, I was picked up by a music notation company because I had done some notation work and won some awards. And I was 17 years old, so I was very young. And I started working NAMM shows. Um, I, ha I loved it. Somebody was talking earlier about, you know, if, if it's your passion, you can make it work. And I didn't know what work ethic was or anything at that time. I was very young. And uh, it just, it turned into something I just kept doing. And I kept working for companies at NAMM shows. And when I got older and I had a bachelor's degree in music, I started getting work that way. I would meet people and, uh, you know, they would hire me and I started getting really, really good work out of it, uh, working for cruise lines, doing notation. This is another industry, by the way, that we don't think of very often. There are people that need to notate music. Um, but uh, it, I, you know, I, the, I, got, I got to the point, it, it gets to the point where you, um, you, you think, you don't know where you're heading, and you think, you know, this is a hard lifestyle. There are times when you don't have any work maybe coming in, and you're trying to support yourself, especially like most of you are going through school. And for me, it just, it just kept happening. And I think if you keep your eye focused on what your passion is, and you just keep trying, things, it, weird things happen. Th you know, you create your niche, and it happened for me, and I want you to know that. And um, I'm up here on this panel today with some amazing, amazing people, and I can't even believe I'm sitting here today. You know, if I look back on where I came from, I'm an accordion player, I'm a <laughs> band geek and a notation nerd. <laughs> and you never mentioned the accordion, Christy. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and I've had just an amazing life. The, the product rep side of, of this, I was a freelance product rep, and I was sent around the nation. I've been, there were times when I was finishing my master's degree that I was gone for a month at a time. And I was doing, you know, clinics and demonstrations and product training. And I developed my own business and I started, you know, I've got so many clients now, I, I, I need some people that know notation to help me out. Um, but, you know, it just, there are going to be times when, when it's slow though. Um, and that's, that's the hard part about this. There are going to be times when m the work is flowing in and you're loving it and the hours don't even matter. You know, when, like I said, I was gone for months at a time away from my husband and it didn't matter because I was loving what I was doing. But then you come home after that month and then you have this, this month of nothing. And that was the hard part for me. Um, it wasn't as much the crazy hours as it was just this erratic, you're employed and then you're not employed sort of thing. And you have to be ready for that. You have to have thick skin for that. Um, so, um, but you can do it. it. You know, you go through this drought period and then all of a sudden you're busy again. So just hang in there. But you don't have to do this full time. This can be a part-time job. You don't, I mean, if there's, if it's something that's your passion, a lot of us call it supporting our habit. We go do something else so we can do this or while you work on your skills. I was at a dinner the other night and I'm sitting next to this guy and we're talking music and talking music and talking music. I said, well, what do you play? He says, oh, I'm a bass player. He says, I'm a doctor during the day, but I'm really a bass player. And that's how he thought of himself. So it may be something where you're going to have a different occupation during the day. Uh, I play gigs with guys who are policemen and uh, who work uh, here or there, accountants and stuff, but they think of themselves as, as musicians, and it's, it's a very rich life for them. So you could be in the recording industry part-time and do other things. You could actually have a family, have relationships, and still get a great deal of satisfaction out of the fact that you produce music and you go out and play from time to time, and that you could create, dare I say it, a balance in your life. Thank you very much. The secret word, balance. <laughs> We're here united 
for one cause, music. We all love music. How much do we have to know about it? How much do we have to know about what people did before us? How important is a traditional music education? Laura. Well, I would say on one hand, as much as possible, but then I would say on the other hand, I've worked with some composers who are now really big composers who knew very little about anything. But they had, they had their niche, they had their talent, they were either good music program, good programmers and could plink around, couldn't read music, couldn't notate, couldn't do anything, and that's where everyone here could come into play because you could do that all for them. They hired teams of people. So in an ideal world, you know, I don't think you can ever know enough but to survive, and unfortunately or fortunately, you could probably know very little, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish that was the case for me. I needed a lot of training. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> well, I think that, like anything else, um, when you say maybe a formal education, as in going to school, getting degrees, or just, just simply obtaining an education somehow, a lot of these composers that you're talking about they know what they're doing somehow. Maybe, maybe it was self-taught. Maybe it was just through trial and error. Um, when I was learning acoustics, we didn't have the internet, so I used to call libraries and ask if they had certain books, and I'd drive all over the, the state so that I could study about acoustics because I really wanted it. I think that with music, I, I had some formal music training, and I was a session player for a lot of years, but most of it I learned from taking whatever I learned in school, whatever I learned from other players, and really what I learned from myself by just experimenting. And I think that the experimentation aspect of, of this entire industry is it's the creative aspect that we can't, can't overlook. And I think schooling sort of sets you on course for that, but it's really what you're going to get from inside in your own experimenting and your own creative spirit and your own ability to express what's inside of you, the education and the formal training or tools that might help you to articulate that better. But it really comes down to finding your own voice and whether it's you can read music or whether you play by ear or a little bit of both. I think that learning can come from a lot of places. Thank you, Vikas. And then we'll go to Jeff and then we'll go to Jenny. I think if somehow you land in a position uh, on a treasure box by chance, you're very lucky. But from my experience, I would never advise someone to do something if they're not willing to work hard at it. And that means if you have a passion and a love for it and you want to do it professionally, you should know as much about everything that relates to that thing as possible because the world is large and it's as global, you know, <laughs> People are flying across and running internet and this and that. So there's always someone 10 to 100 steps ahead of you. Don't enter the industry if you're not willing to do the research and the backup and learn everything about your trade, whether you're making tires for a car or you're in the music industry. That would be my advice, seeing and being around people. Um, so if you're looking for the easy shortcut, I, there's very few that exist. Um, I think once you get a taste of one shortcut, you, you wish for another, but there are, there are very few shortcuts. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, and I also think just as a musician, you know, you can't do yourself a better favor than to learn more about music and be, learn to express yourself better. I mean, when I was a kid, if, if we weren't exposed, if I hadn't been exposed, I happened to live near the Lighthouse, yeah. a famous jazz club in Hermosa Beach, and I was listening to all the stuff everybody else was listening to on the radio, and then I walk by the lighthouse, you know, and I, and I hear uh, George Benson, or, or I, heard, I heard Wes Montgomery, I heard all kinds of great players, I'm a guitar player, and, and I thought, wow, you could do that. And then, uh, and then someone gave me a record of a Segovia record, I went to a Segovia concert when I was like 11 years old. I said, wow, you could do that. So I, I ended up having a career where I made a lot of records for Concord Jazz in the jazz world, and they, they were actually successful for Concord, but in the jazz world, that's not very many records. And, but because I could play pretty much anything in just about any style, somebody asked me on the side to play a record. A guy who was a sideman in my band was making a new age record. And, and he said, well, would you go in and do this? Whatever you do, don't play with very much expression. You know, don't play too many notes. Don't play, you know, just play it as straight as you possibly can. And I went in there and played for this record producer and I played 
you know, they had music in front of me, and I'm playing the simplest thing, as straight as I could play it, and I'm thinking, this is, you know, ridiculous. The, you know, the guy's going to think it's off. I can see him shaking his head in there. And after we finished the session, the guy says, the, his, the problem was, I played it with too much expression. I, was, I put the vibrato on it or something, you know? I did, you know? So I tried to play it as straight as I could. By the end of the record, it was just me and this piano player. By the end of the record, we had worked our way into being kind of artsy and, you know, getting a little bit of our creativity in there. The record sold 600,000 copies, more than all my other records combined, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, just the fact that, and, and then we went on a tour. We went on, I mean, I, we went on a tour in Asia after we'd sold a few million records. We went on a tour in Asia, played three concerts that took in a million dollars. Three concerts in Asia that took in a million dollars, you know, and I saw almost $500 myself, which was great. <laughs> 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 but, 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 but I mean, it, you know, just being open, you know, being able to do as much as you can and then being open to every opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, you, it, it's, you never know where the money's gonna come from. It sounds like there were other people involved in your project. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's where the money went. I oh, think. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, everybody here probably knows where the money went, but, but it, you know, the con I agreed. I agreed to my fee, and, they ta and we know what we're going to get paid before we get on an airplane, and it's in an escrow account, and this is what you're getting paid, which I thought was really great, until I got to these venues and saw that we were selling out these huge venues, and we did one with a symphony orchestra. We sold out the venue, and people were paying $200 for seats and stuff. I'm thinking, and that's what I got, you know? <laughs> Yeah, Jeff, so what, what's new age for sucker? Yeah, sucker. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason we we actually did it under a phony name because we were like kind of embarrassed. Some, no, se semi semi jazz snobs, you know. And so we didn't actually call it new age. We called it newage. Newage. <laughs> new <age. laughs> but 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 it's actually it's very sincere music, and it sounds pretty, and there's nothing wrong with it, and it makes a lot of money. Very very nice, <laughs> Jenny. I think the question that you all need to ask yourself is what kind of musician do you want to be? And that's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, and most of you would probably say, you know, I'm, I'm the thirsty for knowledge type. I want to know everything there is to know. And um, I was that type, or I am that type, I should say. And the flip side of that is that there's a point where you have to say, I know enough and I'm ready. And I'm ready to do this. So, you know, learn what you need to learn, but then don't, don't stick with that. There's a point where you're going to know what you need to know and you need to just jump in. Can I, can I add something? I'd, uh, because. An entrepreneur once said, it was the founder of mp3.com, that entrepreneurs build their parachute after they jump out of the airplane. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I kind of want to echo that. We talk about preparation and things and for better or for worse, if you're offered a job, I mean, make sure you're not so in over your head that you're going to uh, tear the project down. But if you can get by do it. Sometimes I've offered a job to people. Sometimes when the person is offering you the job, they know that you are not completely qualified, but they see something. And they know in the back of their head that, you know, they're going to keep their eye on you and they're going to pull you along and they're offering it to you. And I have <coughs> students saying, no, nah, I just can't do that. And I'm thinking, okay, next. And so something's given, comes your way, um, just grab it. And I just want to make one more point on the music knowledge, because I am a teacher and I teach, you know, over 200 students a year, and a lot of the students who don't have musical background get really excited with programs like Reason, where they can produce something that sounds kind of good, pretty good, without any musical background. Um, you'll drive a car better if you know how it's built. So if you're thinking of a profession, what you think sounds good is, is, is okay, but on the professional level, when someone with the musical background and the history takes ha hold of your tools, which they will, they're gonna they're gonna outshoot you. There's no way you can compete um, with with someone who has that background. Most of the time, there's always exceptions. John, please. Yeah, a, a slightly different take on the um, whole idea of of having knowledge. I mean, you kind of gain it as you develop as a musician, anyway. I feel whether you want to or not, it's kind of it just soaks into you. Um, I did four years training with a guy called Ike Isaacs in London one of the great bebop jazz guitar players, kind of unheralded, but was a fabulous <coughs> musician. Never really got to use that skill. I, I, I found, I got these gigs being a rock guy, you know, I was on tour with a lot of rock bands and he made a ton of money, had a great life, but I've always craved the jazz thing, you know, and I, I still aim to get back into it if I don't run out of time. But um, there was a, a great story about Django Reinhardt, and for those that aren't familiar with Django, he was um, a, a 
jazz player from the 30s through the 50s. He died quite young. He had a disability where he only had really had two active fingers on his left hand. The other was damaged in the fire. And if you ever get to listen to Django Reinhardt's music, he worked with a guy called Stefan Grappelli, a great uh, jazz uh, violinist. And he, they got him to the States eventually, in the early 50s, when he was playing electric guitar. And he got a gig with the Count Basie Orchestra. And uh, he came up to him and said, Django, uh, we're going to play this song. He goes, OK, great. He goes, what key are you playing? He goes, I, I don't know any keys. Just start playing, and I'll play. <laughs> the guy had absolutely no musical knowledge whatsoever, but he was truly one of the greats of, of any form of music that's ever been on the planet. So I would suggest that as much as uh, learning is f a fabulous thing, and I applaud it, and, and, and I, I insist on it if ever I'm giving people guitar lessons, but uh, the heart and the passion and the soul should not be ignored either in music. You know, we're a very technologically uh, based age now, but there's a lot more to it than just the technology. Talent. Christy, can I just <coughs> so add one, one uh, thing? Um, I was doing a session, a film scoring session for 20th Century Fox, and before we started, I noticed the trumpet players uh, in the trumpet section, this full orchestra, were, had their heads together, and they're looking at this music, and they're looking back and forth, and they're marking stuff up. Now, we hadn't played a note yet. And I mean, I'm going, what are they doing with this music? And we finished the session, and they went up to the arranger, and they said, we found some mistakes in the part. We went ahead and fixed it. Now, who are you going to hire back? <clears throat> Somebody who's a great player? Now, this is top making a lot of money, people. Who are you going to hire back? Somebody who's a great player? Or somebody who's a great player that makes your job easier. You know, they're probably spending ten thousand dollars every ten minutes for all these people to be in there. Somebody with the knowledge and the theory. That's why I would hire somebody like Mario, who's a writer and a composer, who can look at something and say, "Okay, this isn't going to work," and fix the problem without taking up any time in the session. So there is, depending on the venue, is this, I forget your name, but this is just one young woman said way down there on the end. You have to decide what it is you're going to do and then decide what skill set you have to have to make that work and also look at who your competition is. Because we used to say in, in Los Angeles, somebody comes in and thinks they're all that, we used to say, well, we'll let them starve for a year and then they'll come back with a better attitude. Because <laughs> for every job like that, there's 10 people just as good as you in line want to have that, want to have that gig. Wes. I was just going to say one of the best things I ever uh, heard is that, you know, everybody says music is a language, and I think that's totally true. And if it is a language, why would you not want your vocabulary to be as extensive as it possibly could be? Um, you know, obviously, you want to know everything that you possibly can. Maybe you won't ever need to use it. And, you know, if you're uh, writing poems, you probably would want to know as much English as you could if you weren't. Maybe you'd never use those words, but it's still good to know them. And you know, especially I'm finding like I, I studied jazz pretty extensively and all that kind of stuff in LA. I've never used it ever since being out here. It's been pop, rock, those kinds of sessions. Um, but it's still good to know it for that one session when it comes into play. There will uh, be the the day. Yeah, there we'll will be the day. day. And and uh, you know, it's like a a carpenter's toolbox. You want your toolbox to have every tool in it that you could ever possibly need. Maybe you don't ever need to use it. But I think that's kind of where, at least for me, theory was and all of those kinds of things. Um, and I think the other thing is that I had a professor of mine once tell me that, uh, you know, you can have knives and everything in your kitchen, but that doesn't make you a chef. That just means that you cook and it's out of necessity. Owning a guitar maybe doesn't make you a musician. It's the things that you do with it that, that make you a professional at it and give you that, that rite of passage. So. I think it's, you know, if you can, it's always best to do it. Put everything in your toolbox that you can so that you're always prepared no matter what. Thank you. Uh, the road to getting this information and getting this skill set can be long and arduous or it can be very quick and uh, exhilarating. Uh, here at Miracosta, we try to not use the word just. We take that out of the vocabulary. And the other three words are if I only because everybody's looking for the Swiss Army knife to be able to solve the conundrum of trying to break into the industry, trying to do what their dreams are telling them to do. To do. Uh, what tools do you think are absolutely necessary for the modern musician? 
So I'd like to use the word, if I only had this, <laughs> and if I just got this, what she, would they be? You know, just... In spite of... Sorry, mate. Go ahead. <coughs> okay. John. Just, just to, uh, once again, it goes back to um, you've got to have what you have between between uh, your ears. You know, you've got to have your brain, and you got to you have to listen. You really have to listen to what's happened before you, and uh, and it'll give you an idea of... Where you know we talked about finding a certain niche, finding out something that someone really hasn't taken the time to to do, whether it's gamelan music and punk, or whether it's uh, a harpsichord and a twelve string guitar and uh, screaming children. You know, they, they you, you gotta you gotta listen and listen and listen and listen and pay attention to everything that's happened before, and. Uh, that's you know that's just so important that's that covers your history that covers your 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 theory your harmony you know all the all the major stuff that I've got in my life I was I was uh, when I got my first big break in the 70s I was uh, I had played shows. I'd been playing Dixieland. I'd played with the L.A. Junior Philharmonic. I'd been playing Latin music, mambos on Saturday nights. Been playing the Elks Lodge accordion bands, and I was playing with the most outside group of musicians who we were, we were playing Anthony Braxton free jazz, and we were just out of our minds. And the guy, the bass player, stopped and goes, "Oh, by the way, Helen Reddy's looking for a new drummer." Would you like to play with her? And I go, yeah. He goes, John, you read, you play your, your butt off, and you're incredible. Uh, yeah, you got the gig. Oh, and she's going to be doing a TV show. So I became the house drummer on the Midnight Special. Mm. It just sort of happened, and I was in a whole other direction. Same thing, I, I got called to do a movie session. One time, this friend of mine, Steve Bartek, who I played with, because you always want to play with the best musicians you can. Yeah, we just played a gig over in Hermosa Beach, and he goes, so we need a drummer for this movie we're doing, The Forbidden Zone. I, I played a band with Danny Elfman. I go, okay, great. So I played the movie, and it was really ridiculous. It was really difficult. And four weeks later, they came to a rock and roll show where I was playing with some of the guys from Devo and, uh, and Tony Basil and all this, and they heard me playing, and they were like, wow, that's the guy we want to get. You know, I, I wanted to be a jazz drummer. I wanted to play with Count Basie. You know, everybody was into Jimi Hendrix, and I was into Duke Ellington. You know, I've always been kind of slightly off, but those opportunities came and knocked, and I was, yes, sir. Yeah, I'll do that right there. I'll be right there. And when I first joined uh, Oingo Boingo, I never thought I'd be in a band called Oingo Boingo. <laughs> and, and it was called the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, and they did Calypso tunes, early Duke Ellington, and I had to learn a gamelan piece and a ball phone piece. And I'd never heard any, any of that kind of music. And then two years later, they go, so oh, we're just going to have a rock and roll band. We'll call it Oingo Boingo. I go, okay, that's good. And, and you see, you never really quite know. But, you know, the more prepared you are, the more you study, the more you get into everything, any possible thing. You know, think of, think of showing up to the most famous session, and, and the first thing they're going to say is, you're not this. You're failing because you're not this. Well, I went to bed every night going, I'm going to start making my own list because I never, I never want to. I never want to be there. I want to have so much fun when I play. When I go into a session, I want to be, oh, yeah, mambo, sure. Polka, <laughs> you bet. Punk, you got it. Can you play harder? You know I can. <laughs> you know? I, I, it's all music you can enjoy I, playing. I, it's all music I enjoy playing. This is a I, yes man. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I think the, the important thing is there's no such thing as overnight success. It's all about that preparedness to take up advantage of the opportunity when it shows up on your doorstep. That's really what it's about. And then you can leverage it from there and build your career from it. It's just being in the right place, right time, and having the talent to back it up. You gotta have... Uh, yeah. <laughs> there are exceptions. <laughs> you gotta have one attitude when you're in the studio, and that simply is, there are no problems, only solutions. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Chris. When you were asking about what tools, were you talking about technical tools or ability tools? I didn't want to specify. Okay. I, I, I got kind of a, a take on. I didn't want to specify. I've got two points, really. We've been talking about knowledge and music and having 
all this different ability to play a lot of different styles and that those are phenomenal tools but I don't want anybody out there to be discouraged there may be somebody I was one of these guys who I got into jazz and all that stuff in college but I was never a guy that was going to be like like you who could be really great at so many styles I, I was always really good at you know a few styles and it's gotten me on some good projects and some good records and film scores etc aside from my day gig my acoustics but you know some of you may be sitting out there and man I just don't have the brain for jazz think about some of the most successful uh, singers Neil Young's a great example you know Neil's Neil's not doing a whole lot of intricate stuff but I'll tell you what he can quiet a crowd of a hundred thousand like nobody else same with people like you know, Jackson Brown made a record by himself went out him and one guy I know Jackson I played with him simple stuff it's you know simple in a in a in a deep way but um, don't be discouraged because you don't have the buzzsaw chops or because you don't have the mind to be able to play 20 different styles and maybe you're not driven to learn all those different styles maybe you know three chords and you can do more with those three chords than a lot of people could do with 300 that's okay that's good in fact the more meaningful music out there that's moved us all by majority or you know Beatles, Stones, that's not real intricate stuff. Maybe some of those guys have a lot of knowledge about other music, maybe some of them don't, but don't be discouraged. Use your tools, use what, what, um, what your tool set as a person is capable of. That was, that was my first point I wanted to make, because there's so much talk about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Don't forget about the soul and, and what you can do with that. And, minimal tools you know a guy a really good builder can go out with a, a chainsaw and a hammer and outbuild somebody who's got a truck full of tools since we're talking about tools I just I'm going to echo what we talked about in the first session which is what you really need you need a good microphone if you're going to record and I'm going to self promote a little bit about my speaker company you need great speakers because you got to be able to capture it on this end and then listen to it on the other end and everything in between there's a whole variety of things you know computers some people still use analog machines uh, I've got a four track recorder on my iPhone for nine bucks you can get that app but you got to have you got to have a microphone to capture it and then you've got to have a good set of speakers so that you can listen back to it and a set of speakers that tells you the truth and that doesn't tell you it's good if it's not good and back to the acoustics an environment that doesn't color the sound to where the speakers are not actually being true to your ear there's a lot of things that the room is is uh, attributing to the sound that maybe is coloring it artificially so these are all tools if you want to translate your work as an engineer or producer you need to have a good tool set of recording and monitoring in an environment not only for listening but also for recording and that would be my answer to the to the uh, physical and the emotional tool set great thank you we've <coughs> walked over to the uh, technical side that's great Cynthia I'd like to add to that I work with a lot of creative people and a lot of creative employers in industries outside of the music industry and I'm hearing very similar things being versatile being prepared being able to say yes being able to work hard and one of the most, the statements that I hear most often is people want to work with people that they like. Mm -hmm. So it's in addition to having all the talent and the skill and, and being truly yourself, which is absolutely critical, but to be likable. And I'm so happy to hear the comments by the member of Oingo Boingo, because that was one of my favorite bands. <laughs> and you can hear by the way he talked to you, anybody would want to work with that man. I mean, th think about that attitude and the liveliness. I mean, that he really illustrates that feeling that you want to have fun when you work and you want to work with people that you like. Thank you, Laura. Oops, it'll be technical, not technology challenge. Actually, I was going to just pretty much say what Cynthia said, which is on both sides of the coin. I've been hired because people liked being around me. And I've hired, you know, if I've had a bunch of five or 10 people and some were really qualified, but then I thought, do I want to be in a room with them for nine months, 18 hours a day? And it was like, no. <laughs> so it's important. I mean, just being likable, you can, you know, be maybe not quite, quite as up to par, but if people like being around you, that's, they'll hire you. And it's, it really is a basic skill which people tend to forget about, and I think it's really, really important. 
So we're emphasizing the importance of people skills, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I add something? Because, and then we're going to bring it on home. Um, I've been in, in uh, both in different businesses, and so I, I, I see music industry as its own, but I also see it similarities with any industry. When I had a restaurant, I had one of my uh, best mentors was someone who sold socks. And so I, I saw all the similarities in these businesses. And when we're talking about the industry being kind of topsy-turvy, one thing I've found um, is you do have to find a way to balance within yourself. And so when all goes you know, crazy around you, for better or for worse, either because it's going really bad or on the flip side, it's going really good, that's also another type of craziness. Do you get sucked into the craziness and then you go crazy and your energy is like dissipating in the air? Or do you have a certain practice that keeps you centered so you can function on anywhere from one to four hours of sleep and you have a way, whether you're in, in a trailer home or outside or in someone else's sofa or in your own home, to always center yourself and then and come with that focus to what you're doing. Um, and I found th that helped me throughout the different businesses because whatever business I've done, when you have your own and you work for yourself, it's always crazy. It doesn't matter what you do, but usually when you work for yourself, there's crazy moments. Thank you. The main purpose of today was to offer solutions to people looking for jobs in the music industry. What would be your best advice for places to look for work at? Are there websites? Are there doors to knock on? Are there people to speak to? Hands to shake? Where should these people go? Doug. I'd like to pitch in from the uh, standpoint of being a record producer and you have to come up with an idea to keep yourself employed. This may not affect the overall picture of what everybody's looking for, but you'll find when you're listening to people and going on the internet, there's a general dissatisfaction today with white lighting. Everybody works under white lights. They come home, the first thing they do is in a bathroom, white lights, kitchen, white lights. There's a general movement for an ambience, change ambience. Some people put on music, some people put on sounds. I mean, years ago, I had a marvelous run with um, Mystic Moods. They, uh, I put sound effects and sold platinum after platinum with it, you know. Sound of horses on the beach and uh, songs took the melody line off and just played the background. Uh, actually, I saved an LP. The girl lost her voice, so I didn't have any voice, so I put sound effects on it. Sold platinum. So, uh, see, it <laughs> happens. Uh, well, it happened to me also, if you want a joke like that, in the 50s. Uh, the organist, um, uh, Dave Baby Cortez, lost his voice and he was singing. She said, I can play the organ, Doug. Let's make something up on the organ. I said, okay, let's go. He said, I can only play in C, so everybody had to play in C. <laughs> he was doing shortening bread. I called it the happy organ. I sold a million number one in 1958. So things, uh, it's a question of if you have the ability, turn your mind onto what's going on. Right now, there's a huge market for sound effects, which digital plays a big part in. Lighting, digital, people want to get home and change their atmosphere. They want to, re they want to be away from, an, you, you can't always run around the corner to a cafe now and hear somebody playing an acoustic guitar, sit back, have a coffee. You can't do that. These days are changing. You are off the freeway where you're all rea reared up. You're home, you got the white lights again, you're back at work. Start to turn your mind into what people want and supply it. We may not have a, an industry distributing sound effects, I don't know if there are, or gift shops, but people want sound effects. There's a huge market out there for a change of atmosphere. Help. help. It's a service. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Thank you. Where else can we go for jobs? Uh, yeah, I'd feel a little guilty not chiming in this whole time with any advice, but um, I think there's a lot of ways to get to what you want, but as far as what I can tell you is if you work 
above and beyond of what you could learn at school, or even on your own, just like step at night learning Pro Tools or learning analog equipment, anything that may not seem relevant at the time, but down the road might be relevant. It can never hurt to have too much knowledge on something. And as far as getting into the business, I, I mean, there's a bunch of ways, but when I was in high school, I um, got a job sh doing shipping for a plug-in company for Pro Tools. And from there, I mean, I got deals in software and stuff, which is, which is cool. And um, from there, I went into being like the product specialist and teaching how people how to use the software. And then even helped design, and, uh, they made Auto-Tune, Tune's vocal. So I got to have a hand and like, hey, this would be cool if this had this, or you know, it'd be a lot easier. And from there, it just everything leads to another. So if you just keep pushing forward and have a good attitude about it, like it'll bring you where you want to go. I think. How did you get your job uh, in the shipping department? Uh, <laughs> it's funny. I was in a band, and we wanted to rent their, they had a hardware piece for vocal tuning, because we had some background singers who <laughs> were pretty rough. <laughs> and um, so they're like, well, we don't rent it, but um, you know, there's this guitar set or a guitar showcase that was up in Northern California. Rent rents the products, so we're like, oh, okay, we'll go there. And um, he's like, oh, by the way, do you know anyone that n would be into shipping? Or because we need someone in the in the back. And we're like, oh, no, not right now. We're busy during school. But then in the summertime, I called him back. I was like, hey, I'm looking for a job. I noticed, you know, they're in the same area, so it worked out. But so it's a good idea to look in the the area. Well, yeah. Uh, someone said the, the earlier session, don't be afraid to make phone calls. Like, I know a lot of people have ideas like, oh, I can't call that company. You know, they're like, they're the number one selling plug-in of all time. Like, why would I call them? And they're just normal people. And they're like, yeah, I'll give you a job. Whatever. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Make the phone call, right? We'll go here. Oh, let's go to Rob first, and then we'll come back. Um, a couple places right. that, um, as far as live um, mixing, uh, that people get jobs that have come through the theaters have been uh, with youth theaters. Um, they've just had a brother or sister that's been there and they've actually gotten on the sound crew and actually gotten to a point where they've amassed a lot of knowledge about live mixing. Um, also churches. A lot of churches now have um, praise bands or worship yeah. bands and they have crews where people actually get a chance to mix live sound um, every Sunday and then during rehearsals. Um, and also another really good um, resource I think is actually, um, you're already here, at school. Um, we have a relationship with uh, Miracosta and I'm sure they've got relationships with other people. That's and the we California hire a lot Center of, for the Arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the California Center for the Arts. We hire um, interns. Uh, some of our interns come through Miracosta and we've had interns that uh, one of them, I think, is now a mixing or recording engineer in Nashville. So we've had people that have come through Miracosta, come through us, learned a bit, and moved on and gone farther off into the business. So definitely your networking skills. I mean, there are people all around you probably that might have heard about a job out there. And if you just keep talking to people, you'll hear about them. Okay, we'll end with Craig here. Well, I just, I just wanted to encourage the students to, to make sure, you know, keep your mind open that there's a lot of ways to make a living in the industry. And, and uh, I don't know how many of you are, are artist bound. If that's, if that's the pie in the sky for you to be the rock star or an artist, that's awesome. Follow your passion, do all that kind of stuff. It's also good to, you know, have a life. And, and um, there are a lot of ways. You've heard a lot of them here today. And, and um, you know, for me, I was supposed to be a rock star by the time I was 22. I'm 46 now. And when I was, when I was 29, I, I'll just tell the story real quick. I was, I, I was with a band. They got signed. We were up in L.A., fell apart, classic story. Got a job at West L.A. Music. And I had been doing sessions and um, recording for quite a while. And I, I learned how to use the Lindrum when it first came out and was pretty quick on it. So I was doing jingles and the Drum Cat, which is a trigger interface for drummers. Um, anyway, a guy came in one day, and, and, and it happened to be a percussionist going out on a big pop tour, and he didn't know how to program the thing. I just went over, just wanted to meet the guy, hung out, programmed for him. I'm at his house, and I'm listening to these multi-tracks and going, wow, I, you know, that's Janet Jackson. This is like 93. You know, I get a call a week later, and I'm on the road. I never thought I would be a tech. And as a matter of fact, at that point in my life, I would have thumbed my nose at a tech. So try to tell the story real quick. I get out on the road, 
tour the world for 18 months, and I realized I like the tech people better than the musos, than the mus musicians. <laughs> I'm still a musician. I'm st I, I've had a really good career playing sessions and doing all that, but I love that side of the industry, and, and it's, it's so important. And, and the, one thing, the one thing you got to keep in mind, man, it's like when you look at the musicians, they come and go on these tours, and they're usually all about the same age, especially on the pop tours. They're right around, you know, 23, 25. But the guys that are good at what they do, the support crew, they are there year after year. I've got a friend, Terry Lawless. He's playing keys with U2. He's 54 years old. Started with Barry Manilow, pushing his piano out onto the stage. Great programmer, monster programmer, keyboard player, sax player. Now he's getting writing credits with the band. He's, he's a rock star. Nobody even knows who he is. And he's a crew guy, and it's rad because it's... It's a real job, man. There's nothing wrong with, doing, with being a support person. So if you can check your ego about being the artist as you go along, it's okay to make a living. There's no shame in, in like supporting a family and all that. So anyway. I think that's great. So there is hope for us who want to have a normal lifestyle in music. This is, this yeah. is great. Yeah. So we'd like to open up uh, the microphone over there for questions from the audience. Would anyone like to come forward and ask our illustrious panel here any questions? Please come forward. Are you afraid? <laughs> no time to be shy now. <laughs> Lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Please come up. Thank you. I know for... Uh, um, like someone that's looking to be a recording engineer, I know I'm taking a class here currently. Um, it's a second semester class. And um, there's a couple of other schools, trade schools, that I've seen a lot lately advertised in magazines and stuff um, for recording. Um, that is like a specific trade school. How would that compare to doing something like an internship where you're saving, you know, the twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars Sa save your money, in my opinion. And it's more like $80,000. Kids come yeah, out of Yeah, they're, they're pretty expensive schools. Yeah, okay. and, there's, and there's, of course, I mean, there's going to be stars that come out of any of those schools. But if you're serious about it, you're going you're gonna to put the time in on your own, you know, little rig at home. Go get an internship. And for God's sake, don't be like some interns that, that show up and wait to be told what to do. You know, if there's downtime at the studio, you don't have to be cleaning the toilets like everybody freaks out about. You could be whipping out the manuals and maybe teaching the engineer how to use that new plug-in that he doesn't know how to use because, that he bought because he's too busy working. You know what I mean? There's, it, be proactive about the opportunities you have. And, and uh, you know, I think an internship's the way to go. There's a few good studios in, in the county, and interns are hard to come by, really good ones. I would say <coughs> one in 20 are worth keeping. So. Yeah, I, I would agree. Just, you know, an internship is, is invaluable. You're going to learn so much more on the job. But the trick in, in being a good intern is knowing when to speak up and knowing when to be quiet. You know, there's a lot of time you're just going to be studying and waiting on hand to be called to do something. But the other, there are times when if you step up, you can actually contribute to whatever's going on. And from there, you forge all those relationships. Make sure people know who you are when you're in there. Because as soon as you leave, suddenly you have a little network and those people move on. And, and that's all part of it. I just add that... Um, Nobody is going to ask you where you went to school or what degrees you have when you get into it. They want to know if you can do the job. And uh, I, was, I do a lot of stuff with video, and I was recently talking to a major cinematographer, and he said, yeah, we have great people on our staff who don't have a high school education, but they are amazing at what they do. So put yourself a portfolio together and show people that you know how to do the job. You can have a PhD, nobody will care. Can I, can I add? Um, I would, I always suggest to my, because when you get into the audio tech, I mean, you just want to slobber over buying all this stuff. I mean, I refuse to look in the catalogs anymore. Um, and so students always say, what do I need? And I always say, work with what you have. And when you get to a point where you've truly, absolutely cannot move for forward, then maybe think about investing. But that means borrowing, using, putting together, piecing together, using school resources. Then as you move up into what you need because you've exercised all options, then you'll actually value that next piece of equipment or that other education that you pay for. But 
obviously it's their job to sell you stuff so they'll get you real excited that if you pay for this it will profit and benefit you but if you don't earn your way into it you're not going to value it anyways so paying x amount of money for gear or an education if you haven't worked your way into it and can really appreciate the extra stuff it has to offer you then it's not going to benefit you you can do a lot with the four track and learn a lot with the four track before you go out and spend a ton of money on a ton of gear Wes. I was just going to say the same thing. I think that um, you know maybe a, a good school name or, or those kinds of things might help you get get that foot in the door. If you're having trouble actually finding the internship, then maybe um, you know whatever it is that's on your resume might help you get the internship over somebody else. But once you know if if a studio's got 20 interns, they're not worried about asking what what school you came from or whatever it, it may be. It's all about. Uh, who's getting the best results, who's working the hardest. Um, back in Boston, I started as an intern at Firefly Recording Studios, uh, and I left as the chief engineer. And that was only because I think I was the only one that was willing to do every night. I was doing seven days a week, coming in at midnight and work until 8 a.m. every day, and re willing to do the night shifts and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, it wasn't about who was, who was, had their degree or where it was from or any of that. It was just who was putting in the work. And, um, and who is bringing in the results in. You know, if your portfolio and your, your disk of collected mixes and all of those kinds of things sounds incredible, then that's more important than anything. So if you can achieve those results, I don't think it's important how you get to those results as long as you get there. If some people need schooling and some people need internships, it might be different for everyone, but. Uh, Chilitos, over here on this side? Over here? Chilitos? Here, here, here. here. Anyway, so um, uh, adding to what they're saying, um, I'm, I'm coming out with a new product, you know, like we're talking entrepreneur um, uh, things. Um, I had a partner where we are bringing out a, uh, a simulator. I mentioned it to Christy. I know Caleb saw it. Do you see it at the, at the DC when I were at DC? It's a simulator of, uh, you know, you want to learn sometimes even before you be into the internships. Uh, I, I have a lot of intern guys who come to me, and I train them, and you know, and I, I don't just do them as a runners. I really say, you know how to solder a cable? No, okay, learn. Those things happen, right? But, but this idea that I had with this partner of mine, we actually simulate in the mixing boards. We already have the Mackies, we go into the SSLs, we go into the um, Tridents, uh, the, the real thing, you see in your computer, <coughs> and you can actually move a fader or a button or send a headphone mix or something. If you don't press the mic line, you won't get any results. So this is also a, a good tool that I'm going to be uh, announcing in the, on you know, press releases in magazines because it's such a great tool. Because while you, you, know, you can read, but a lot of people don't like to read. They like to do. See, So it's one thing to read it. And the other thing is doing it. And if you don't have the, especially if you do it, when you, if you get a gig with an, an internship, but the student's always busy, how are you supposed to learn the things when see if the student's always busy? So that's what I got this idea. Why don't we, we create a simulator where what you are, instead of, you know, reading a magazine, get in your computer in the studio and practice what this guy is doing so, you, so when he, should not show up one day or something, it's your turn and you're ready for that. That software is going to be available in the internet as well. So we're going to be announcing it. You know, if you have more information, I have my business cards and, and you can ask me and I can <coughs> let you know what's going on. It's a real great tool for um, learning this actual hands on. So it's another idea. And Miracosta is here to save you that $80,000 also. Yes, that's true. Oh, I know. I love Chris. the courses. <laughs> Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to. to to answer your question also, uh, I think that all these schools are great. You'll learn something having a lot of hands-on. You've got a great resource right here, like, like Christy said. But as far as the internship, what you'll learn when you work at a studio where professional people are working. I, I worked as an intern at Hollywood Sound Recorders. We were recording Michael Jackson, Prince. I saw tricks and I learned things about recording there that I wouldn't have learned in a school. You know, they're, they're putting microphones in the bathroom and using that for your for the ambience and it was the craziest sound I'd ever heard and you just you just don't learn those things typically and these are guys that were really veteran uh, producers and engineers so if you can get in a in a studio where people are actually making money 
to do what you're learning to do, you see how they're doing. You're going to learn things that you that you probably won't learn in a school, and that'll on, go ahead and lead into other opportunities for you. You'll have a, a bag of tricks that you might not get for that 80 grand. We'll have one more question, and we'll wind it down. Uh, my question is, uh, as far as you know, all the history that you know, all you guys bring to the table, and you know, everything that you guys have seen. Um, my question is, what what advice would you give to uh, to a new artist who's trying to you know forge ahead, like in the new, you know, technological advancements where you can almost be an artist and a producer and promote yourself and you know try to go down and wear all these hats at the same time. But, you know, I know that, you know, to achieve a level of success, it's almost impossible to try to do all those things by yourself because only one person can do so much. And uh, I've, I've experienced that in the past. But my question is, is um, who, like, what, what type of people would you recommend that you need to surround yourself around or have on your team to help you, you know, promote your, you know, push it to the level that you want to be at and, you know, to be at where you want to be? My grandmother used to say, show me your friends and I'll show you who you are. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. It's, it's always going to be different depending on your personality anyway, what you need. And at this school, you get an opportunity to work with all kinds of groups and get to know people. I think many of us, as we are starting to come up through the industry, we, we network with people all the time. You'd find somebody. A lot of times there's this synergy around you where the right people seem to come together at the right time. And you, you, know, you have to look at what you have to offer, find people that you have some sort of connection with. And one of the great places to experiment with that is at a college like this because you're going to get to work with different teams of people and you're also going to find out maybe you really like this person and you really get along but you can't count on them they say they can do this you f and you find out the other thing you have to learn how to do is work with people that maybe you don't really like that much but could really help you out and maybe you're going to stretch and develop your people skills so I I'd say practice 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 you can't always count on uh, knowing the right answer until you get into a lot of teamwork situations We'll end with Cynthia. And I'd just like to add one more thing, too. You were, the first part of your question was about technological changes, what's happening in the world that you could self-produce and be out there with your... For the, for like the, because I know there's a, so many artists these days where it's like, you know, all you have to do is, is buy a laptop computer. Yes. That's what I wanted to speak to. And I know I'm sitting next to the Apple rep, but what I'm hearing that's happening out there in the real world is a, is a huge shift that people are taking their laptops with GarageBand out into the field, recording onto GarageBand, and then bringing it back to the studio or working out in the field with Logic Pro. This is an enormous shift that's happening at all levels of the music industry, and it's totally allowing people to go out, be their own producer, developer, doing everything out there, and being very interactive in the field so that the work that you're doing ends up being the studio quality work. It's an enormous sea change. Thank you very much. On behalf of the group, the community, the college, I'd like to thank our panel. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one thing, I just want to say thank you to Christy and congratulations. I, this is the first time I've come here. I'm, like I say, I live in Los Angeles. I just want to say thank you, Christy. It's a great, a great, great service you've given. I think maybe that was the wrong word there, ma'am. Oh, you bet your New Mexico buns it is. <laughs> Would you like to come in? Well, come right on in here. How'd you like a diet soda? That's not to say that you need a diet soda. Uh, how about a beer? Would you, would you like maybe a beer? That'd be good. Okay, but it's not going to do you any good. One beer, come right on. Come to think of it, it's not going to do me any good either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, ma'am, I have come 2,000 miles to a job that is not working out. Now, you know how that is. No. <laughs> you said something about a beer? Yeah, right. I did. <laughs> One beer coming up. Could you make it two? <laughs> two beers coming up. Uh, ma'am, I know I signed that lease and everything, but if this job doesn't work out at that radio station, I just might have to... I just might have to get right on back to Santa Fe. Uh... Ah, here. <laughs> it's a little warm, but take the whole thing. <laughs> hey, that's very nice of you. 
I saved these for Masterpiece Theater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, that, that Alistair Cook's a real cut-up, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah, but I'm kidding aside. I really appreciate your listening to the ramblings of an oh-so-very-unhappy man. And I thank you so much for your understanding in this matter here. A lease is a lease, Mr. Travis. It's God's law. Oh, please, stay for that. Oh, well, look at that. There's the door. Here, uh, make yourself come. Well, make yourself come. Andy, oh, you nuts! Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Gordon Sims, this is my landlady here, Mrs. Murphy. Howdy. Gordon is a disc jockey. He's going to help me out that station that I was uh, telling you about there. Aww. <laughs> so sorry to hear that, Mr. Sims. Come on, help me up, boys. Come on. You know, I've got a business to run, and I, I can't feel sorry for every poor louse who comes around. Thanks for the lift. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean by all? Oh.